because you feel the same way I do. I love this region. This is such a great community uh, for us to live in. Uh, we have one of the lowest unemployment rates in the country. We have 18 Fortune 500 companies headquartered here. And it is a wonderful climate for business and we're productive. Uh, and we have so much opportunity for so many of us. We work at jobs that pay us fairly for what we do. And they're jobs that really make it possible for us to afford childcare while we're working. And we might not consider ourselves to be wealthy, but we know that we have enough money to make choices in our lives. We have enough to eat, and we can always find healthy food at prices that are really within our budget. And some of us, I hope lots of us, travel to work on buses and trains, but many more of us drive our own cars, and then we can hop on bikes, on beautiful bike trails, and we can walk and hike in the parks and the open spaces in the region. It is a beautiful place to live. And we live in comfortable homes, and we feel safe when we walk on those sidewalks and on the streets in our neighborhoods. And we have great amenities for theater and music and art and sports, and we can splurge for a ticket every now and then for something that we're really passionate about. And you know what else? We're involved in our children's schools. And we imagine a future, future for them where they're going to go to college and they're going to get an opportunity to go to work. And we know that we can help them to succeed. So our children have abundant choices. And they're choices like we had about where we're going to live, where we're going to work, and we know that each one of them is going to have a fair chance to achieve his or her full potential. You know what? That's what opportunity looks like. It's not that complicated. It's actually pretty simple if you think about it. And I know you agree with me that this vision of opportunity is, is a vision of a truly prosperous region. And that this is not a vision just for a few families in some communities, um, but it should be for all families, in all neighborhoods, and in all communities, for all of us. And the challenge that we face today is that for some neighborhoods in our region and in some communities, this really isn't uh, what they experience. This isn't the opportunity we would like to see for our entire region. You know, we've made progress on race relations and equal opportunity, but quite frankly, it's not enough. In fact, our nation has some of the most shocking race-based disparities in the country. Our region has race-based disparities that are worse than Atlanta, Chicago, Dallas, Seattle, Washington, DC. I don't know about you, but quite frankly, when I love this region as much as I do, I am pretty embarrassed um, that our region is at the top of a list I don't want to see us at the top of. And that is, we are the top of a list of the 25 largest US metropolitan areas with the worst race-based income disparities in the country. And if we want the vision and the future for opportunity that I just described, we have to change. And we really want that opportunity for all people. So my question to all of you is, are you ready for that challenge? And are you ready to change? Are we ready uh, to ensure that each new baby born, and each high school graduate, and each new job seeker has a fair chance to achieve his or her full potential. In order to change, we really have to know what we're up against. So today, we have for you a summary of the Council's Fair Housing and Equity Assessment. 
And it really gives us a glimpse of where we are today and what the work ahead of us needs to be. Today in our region, only 6% of white people live in poverty. You know, that is probably one of the very lowest poverty rates for white people in the country. But if you're a person of color, it's a totally different story. 25% of people of color live in poverty. And that is one of the very worst rates for a metropolitan area in our country. And research tells us that people who live in poverty have lower high school graduation rates. They're less likely to own their own home. They're more likely to suffer from chronic illness. And they're more likely to be a victim of a crime. Well, poverty by itself really isn't the only problem. As you can imagine, people who live in neighborhoods where most of their neighbors are also poor encounter more barriers to success than people who live in higher income neighborhoods. And growing up in concentrated poverty makes children less likely to succeed than their parents. And this is a pattern that harms families' chances to succeed into the middle class generation after generation. And a subset of these impoverished neighborhoods are also predominantly home to people of color, people who not only face the challenges of concentrated poverty, but face the challenge of race discrimination. And these poor and segregated neighborhoods are what we are terming racially concentrated areas of poverty, or RCAP. The fact is that the poorest and the most segregated uh, neighborhoods in our region have grown substantially since 1990. And I think if you look up here at this map, you can see the racially concentrated areas of poverty. And it's not a story that we want to see for the next 10 years and the next 20 years and the next 30 years after that. In 2010, 9% live uh, of our population, so that's more than a quarter of a million people in our region live in one of these racially concentrated areas of poverty. Just think about that. That is just about one in 10 Twin City residents live in a neighborhood where the odds may be stacked against them. I'm confident that if we agree as a region that this disparity is just unacceptable and it is a barrier to our growth as a region, that we will be able to work together to invest in equity. Opportunity can be within reach for everyone. Think of the possibility for our region to grow, to prosper, if we could eliminate this race-based income disparity. What if we could move 300,000 people out of poverty? What would that look like? Imagine a region where people of color have the same high school graduation rates as a white population, the same employment rates, the same home ownership rates, and what would that look like? Well, you know what it'd look like? We'd have 182,000 more high school graduates. Wouldn't that be great? Uh, we'd have 137,000 more people employed in the workforce, and we'd have 216,000 more homeowners. This economic progress would result in the investment of $35 billion into our economy. This would be money that would be spent on housing and childcare and education and consumer goods. And this is how growth happens. When so many people don't have the opportunity to grow and succeed, we're going to get stuck in, a, in our region. So let me say that one more time. Eliminating racial disparities could inject $35 billion into our regional economy. So investing in equity and opportunity is really investing in regional growth. So I'm sure some of you are sitting out there thinking, well, what does the Metropolitan Council have to do with eliminating disparities anyway? Well, I would say everything. For 46 years, the Council was lauded for thinking regionally in order to help our region prosper. So in 2014, we're opening a new chapter. I think we're moving to an era where we're going to both think regionally, but we're going to act equitably. At the Met Council, 
um, our council members and many of our staff had the opportunity to participate in cultural competency training this past year. And I, I found it just to be a fascinating and an eye-opening experience for me personally, and I know others felt the same. And one of the things we were wrestling with in that training was trying to define what is the difference between equality and equity? What does that really mean? Um, and how would we act on that? Well, one of my de favorite definitions came from Ed, who manages our website, who is involved with the training, and he says this, equality is like a group of people who are dropped in the middle of a lake in identical swimsuits, and they're asked to swim to shore. So it's equal, right? Well, equity, on the other hand, is like a group of people who are dropped in the middle of the lake, and they have what they need to get to shore. Maybe some of them need flippers and a goggles, Maybe some of them need an inner tube. Maybe some of them need a jet ski. I don't know. But <laughs> equity is different than equality because the reality of our world is things aren't equal to begin with. So translated to public policy, equity really requires us to have a tailored approach to each community in our region, and in particularly in areas that have historic disinvestment. When I talk to, to mayors and, and county commissioners and city council members from around the region, I know each one of them care very much about the unique character of their own neighborhood and their own community, and they know it well. So this idea that there are different things needed in different communities should be something that is really easy for us to understand. You know, in our area in our region, disparities like educational attainment and employment are both social and they're spatial. And that means that they may show up predominantly in some geographies and that race and place and well-being are really tied together. So let me say that again. You know, your race impacts where you live. And where you live impacts your health, your education, and your economic outcomes. And we really can't address one without the other. Well, so what role can the council play here? So next month, the decennial regional plan, Thrive MSP 2040, is going to go out for public comment. We've been working on it for a long time, uh, well over a year. Um, hundreds of hours of meetings and listening to people. And uh, probably thousands of people have had the opportunity to provide input to us on this. And this new plan uh, will um, demonstrate for us about how do we take equitable decision making into three key areas, community engagement, housing, and transit. So let's talk about community engagement first. Public engagement uh, model is really something that has to change. And I think we've been working on it, making progress, and I think we're getting there, but we have a ways to go. We want to work with communities to develop solutions. We know um, that government and policymakers decide how resources get distributed. And through our investment decisions, those really have impacts on people's lives. So we want to make sure that people who are impacted by our decisions are telling us what they need, what they want, and what they want to see in their community. So we've begun to change our practices. We are listening earlier. Um, we're trying to listen to people in new and different ways and engage people who have historically not been at the table and who haven't participated with us. So they can have greater impact at the very beginning of our work. So our whole uh, approach to community engagement is to make decisions with people and not just for people. And this is the best way to make our work equitable when people are at the table with us. Second, we want to really work with our partners to create choices in housing throughout the region. And this is across age and race and ethnicity and economic means and ability. We need to get better results in housing uh, and to do that, we can't do that just on our own at the council, but we can partner with community organizations and local governments to serve racially concentrated areas of poverty, to spur the right kind of development in our very poorest neighborhoods with the help of council resources. 
This development will bring about more opportunity for jobs and more opportunity to stabilize housing in areas that have declining values. But better, more balanced neighborhoods um, won't just happen from development and redevelopment. And increasingly, the council really needs to understand its connection with nonprofits and with schools because we know that lifting people out of poverty is a both and proposition. It's affordable housing and a good job. It's job training and transit. It's good schools and safe streets and parks. These things are all connected and all linked. And because economic success is also both and proposition, we want to work to expand connections to employment through equitable transit service and facilities. So let's talk about transportation. We want to make investments in the transportation system that's going to provide both the short-term benefits of construction, those construction jobs are tremendous for this region, but the longer-term benefits of access to both schools and work. So we have something to celebrate coming up pretty soon. I hope everyone here knows what it is. June 14th, we're going to open the Green Line. Yay! Yeah. Woo! Yeah. I, I hope you're all going to be there. Um, I can hardly wait. Uh, it's going to be a great uh, weekend for us. Um, but let's talk about the Green Line and what we know about what's happened this past year. Since we started construction in 2011. Um, this is the largest public works project in the history of the state of Minnesota. 5,400 people have been working to build and design this project. It's really a remarkable story for our state. And in addition to the public money spent on this project, what we know today, and the line hasn't even opened yet, there's been over $1.7 billion in private investment along the line. And I'm not counting the jobs that are engaged with the development of those projects. That's another whole story. But what's exciting to me as a public partner is that when we built this project, 18% of the people who worked to build and design the project were people of color. And, and, and it's not enough, and we need to do more, but 10% of all a dollar spent to design and build this project went to women and minority-owned businesses. And I think that's the part of success as a public employer that we can bring to the, this community. Well, in 2013, in 2013, last year, Governor Dayton proposed an increase of a half cent in our sales tax to be dedicated for transit so we can expand regular route bus service, so we can expand express bus service, so we can build BRT, so we can build LRT. And this is what our region could look like if we can get that thing passed. Um, and we're making progress. We got it passed in the Senate last year, um, and we know transportation is going to be a big topic this legislative session. And if people like you really care about it, I hope you'll talk with your legislators about it and let them know that it's, you think it's important for the future of our region. In December, um, I joined Commissioner Charlie Zelli, our MINDAC commissioner, at a series of town hall forums in the region, about five of them. And this is following on work Charlie was doing all over the state. I think, Charlie, you went to 30 different communities to talk about what do we need for our state and our region to invest in transit and transportation. And what we heard in all of the places I was at was that people want more, and they want it now. And I think that's good news, um, that people really care about this. I want to uh, call back a particular participant who was there who said, you know what? I work downtown, my bus, my bus route, um, the last bus out is at 6. I can't take on late hours and I can't take on special projects because that's my only choice to get home. And so for that individual to have expanded frequency, later bus times, really is about personal ability to succeed, personal economic opportunity. And that story could be played out over and over and over again in this region because it is how people get to work. So transit expansion is certainly linked to personal economic success. And transit is also part of stimulating development in the region. And we're going to be ex 
expanding into a, a really a new mode this year. And for people who don't know about bus rapid transit or BRT, it's going to be fun. You're going to like it when you find out more about it. So um, really, what is it? Well, it's frequent all day service, like a light rail line. Um, the boarding is faster on and off, like on a light rail train. Um, it's more comfortable station amenities. And basically, the trip is just faster. What we know is that on BRT, uh, the line that we're going to propose right out this door, it's 25 to 30 percent faster than regular route bus service. Now that makes a lot of difference to someone in their daily life and the choices they're making. Well, in June, we were really pleased to open um, with our partners, uh, Minnesota Valley Transit Authority and Dakota County, the bread line. Yay for all the people who worked on that. And that goes from Apple Valley to Bloomington. And I think there's a picture. Oh, yeah, there it is. OK, so you can see, wow, that is no ordinary bus stop on that BRT line. And that's the type of amenity we can have on BRT that attracts riders, that makes it faster to get on and off the buses, that would be an investment in our community in the future. So let me talk about the A line. Right outside of this store is Snelling Avenue. Snelling Avenue is a really high frequency bus, bus route today. It carries a lot of rise, riders on a daily basis. I think it's around 4,000 riders. So we're proposing an A-line BRT service on this Snelling Avenue. And let me tell you what it would connect. It's pretty darn exciting. Snelling Avenue is a busy commercial corridor, and it has lots of popular destinations. Of course, McAllister College, Hamlin University, Highland Village Shopping Area, Rosedale Shopping Area, Minnehaha Falls Park, the Midway Shopping Area, and it connects to both the Green Line going from downtown St. Paul to Minneapolis and the Blue Line going from now the Red Line all the way from Apple Valley through to downtown. So the governor requested $10 million in the bonding, um, his bonding proposal this year uh, so we could begin construction on this BRT line um, this next year. And I think it would be really exciting. And I have to say to all my friends in Ramsey County um, who really would like to see this line extended out to the TCAP site in Arden Hills, that's, that's something that we could think about in the future as well. So we have a dotted line on that map for that reason. So we know that the best possible, most equitable transit expansion means high frequency, quality service, and we have to have the right mode in the right corridor at the right time. And we can do that if we have this expanded investment in transit in our region. And we know that will spur development, and we know that will be good for the region as a whole. You know what, this vision of opportunity really isn't easy. This vision of equity isn't easy, and it, and it won't be easy if we don't do things, if we don't act. Sometimes it's difficult because uh, communities might perceive if one community gets a bigger slice of the pie that they're going to get left out. And that's really a barrier to acting equitably. So let's think about that differently. What we know is that if equity is done right and we're investing in disadvantaged communities, what we're going to do is we're going to grow the whole pie. And everyone will be able to get a bigger slice of the pie. And that's how we have to start thinking about acting equitably. So I'm going to challenge each of us to, to think about it. What would we do um, if you are you work with a city, you work with a county, you work with a nonprofit or schools or a business or your community. You know, how are you going to act on this? What, do you, what are you going to do? Um, and I, I think it starts with asking the right questions. Why is equity important to our region? Why is equity important to my business? Why is equity important to my neighborhood and to my community? You know, to me, um, the reasons equity are important are tenfold. Um, it's really about ensuring 
that children who are in grade school today who live in poverty have a chance to achieve their dreams and to be everything that they can be. Uh, and it's also about the future prosperity of our region as a whole. I look at these third graders here in this picture and um, I just see and ask the questions, you know, what's going to happen? Are they going to graduate from high school? Are they going to go to college? Will they be able to get a job? Will they be able to buy a home? Can they earn enough to support their family? Will they become a business owner? Are they going to be the mayor of their city? What, what does their future look like? So I think promises and choices abound for us and for them if we can think regionally and we can act equitably. So I hope you'll join us at the council. Let's roll up our sleeves and let's get to work. Thank you. Well, I have um, some uh, wonderful panelists that I'm going to invite up uh, to deepen the conversation around equity, and I'd like to invite them, and as they're coming up, oh, and our screens are rolling up, I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction to them. Um, they they've each are each really uh, remarkable leaders in our community and are working um, on this whole issue of equity because they're acting on it, they're working on it. And that's what I love about um, having them on our panel today. And I'm going to, as they're coming up, I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. Sandra Sam Samuels is the president and CEO of the Northside Achievement Zone. Um, Sa Sandra is really leading kind of revolutionary change in North Minneapolis. She's really focusing on multi-generational poverty and ending that by a birth to graduation approach to education. She's working in collaboration with 35 different nonprofits and schools, and their single goal is to prepare 2,500 low-income North Minneapolis children to graduate from high school and be ready for college. And they're supporting parents. She's a national leader. She's worked on this issue a lot, and I know she'll have a lot to say. And then I'm also excited to in introduce to you Rapa Maka. Rapa is on my immediate right. Uh, he is the president and CEO of Nexus Community Partners, and that is a community building organization that serves as an intermediary. It helps to build capacity within community-based organizations, um, and they are engaging communities of color to achieve equitable and sustainable development in the Twin Cities region. Rapa has more than 25 years of experience in community-based leadership and wealth building strategies. He's been a member of our policy board of the Quarters of Opportunity, which is now migrating to be called uh, the Partnership for Regional Opportunity. And he is co-chairing, along with Commissioner Jim McDonough, uh, one of our working groups called Regional Equity and Community Engagement. Um, so we're welcome, Rapa. And then Bill McKinney um, on the end is the Vice President of Talent and Long-Term Development for Thrivent Financial. He's been at Thrivent for 11 years. Um, he's led a variety of business groups at Thrivent, strategy and research uh, development, and most recently talent and change management in the organization. And what he is really working on is effectively leveraging uh, Thrivent's ability to keep changing and responding to the community as it grows its business. His boss, Brad Hewitt, the CEO at Thrivent, and Mike Hang, the CEO and president of Wilder Foundation, are leading a work group uh, with the Itasca project called the Socioeconomic Disparities Project, and Bill is deeply involved in that work as well. So give them a big welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so Bill, let me start with you. Um, equity as a growth model. From your perspective, you know, why is that important for the long-term viability of our region? The, uh, I'll, I'll speak from, the <clears throat> from both the Atasca project um, work as well as Thrivin. And the, the, for those of you that aren't familiar with Itasca, Itasca is a group of CEOs, civic leaders, 
uh, government leaders committed to making the Twin Cities a great place to live. It's an informal group. It doesn't have lots of staff. It doesn't have a big budget. It's essentially a voluntary association of leaders trying to make a difference. And the, the three issues that they really have focused on over the last 10 years are education, transportation, and jobs. And at the intersection of those three, they've realized, like all the rest of us, like the rest of you have, that disparities uh, play a really big role in our ability to succeed as a region. And so the, about eight years ago, they took a run at this, this issue of disparities and said, how can we make a difference? And um, came out with a blueprint, came out with a plan, uh, and then 2008 came along and it, the, the situation actually didn't get better. The situation has gotten worse, which you sort of, you listen to the numbers and you think, how could that possibly be? But it's true. And so they've taken a, we've taken another run at it, and, and what's come out of it is really um, two things that, that they're, we're focused on. One is to get large employers committed to actually moving the ball. And there are some that have done a great job, and there are others like us who are really just getting started at helping to address the problem. And then the second one is how do you raise the issue and the awareness of a broader group of people about the, the challenge? I think R.T. Ryback has been part of our group along the way and really said it best, which is this really is, isn't about, it's about addressing a problem, but it's more about capturing an opportunity. Because as a, as a region, we are going to look a lot different than we did. And if we don't figure out how to capture this opportunity, it's exactly the same problem that companies face if they don't respond to the changing face of the marketplace. So cool. that's how we think about it. Thank you. How about you, Sandra? Why, why do you think it's important for economic competitiveness? Yeah, I, I want to start with the, and, and thank you, by the way, um, Susan, I just love the, um, that the Met Council is thinking regionally and acting equitably. Uh, okay. Just major. Thank you. So, thank you. So I'm a quote girl, so I want to start with a quote. Uh, um, uh, Madiba uh, Mandela, who still lives through his words uh, and actions, said, like slavery and apartheid, uh, poverty is not natural. It is man-made and it can be overcome and eradicated by actions of human beings. And so as we think of North Minneapolis, the, the area that I live and represent, and I'm raising three girls and a husband, a dog, a guinea pig, and a cat. Um, <laughs> not raising the husband, but. Um, <laughs> right, trying to. Um, but you know, we've seen, it is really the vortex of, of most disparities. I mean, where the heart of it is really happening in terms of the storm of our region. And, uh, and, and we are there working with a number of organizations. In fact, uh, 37, there's a couple of partners here in the room. If you could wave your hands if you're here, thank you. Um, and, and we are saying that we have to address these issues because there are underperforming assets in North Minneapolis, uh, both in home owners, homes, the value of homes. You know, we are, we've been living there for like 17 years, and we are way underwater. Uh, most of my neighbors are, whether they're middle class or low income, as long as they're homeowners, they are. It's a tax that we pay for living there. And because we pay really little in taxes, um, other areas of the city have to pay more. And, uh, and if, if, if it were more equitable and our home prices were up more uh, and we weren't underwater, then we would all be sharing the weight uh, equitably. Uh, but the main thing is that um, you know, we in North Minneapolis are really modeling ourselves after Harlem Children's Zone in New York, and in fact, um, a co how many of you are familiar with uh, Jeffrey Canada and Harlem Children's Zone? Um, in fact, last year we brought Jeff here, Jeff Canada, because he has done extensive writing around how their region in New York really took on these disparities and have transformed central Harlem at least. Um, he shows um, uh, 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 footage of what buildings look like, so it really got into bricks and mortar uh, 20 years ago before they started really addressing the disparities, the heart of that being education, education, education. Uh, and we actually got a number of CEOs, I think some are in the room today, and asked them to come meet with Jeff uh, last year to talk about how um, addressing disparities there have made a difference. And so Central Harlem, if any of you have been there recently, is not the same place it was 20 years ago. Um, there, in fact, one of the challenges that I think we'll have to address, because we will be successful, in this regional development is that um, many of the low-income residents that were part of Harlem Children's Zone no longer can afford to live in Harlem. Mm -hmm. 
Um, mm -hmm. the, the market prices have gone up so significantly. There's even a banana republic uh, <laughs> in, um, in uh, central Harlem. And I don't necessarily, we don't necessarily need a banana republic in North Minneapolis, <laughs> but we do need uh, some strong businesses. But again, uh, education, 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 and I want to talk more about that, how, how we are trying to do what we are doing, what then Senator Obama said about eight years ago, that if, uh, if poverty is a disease that infects an entire community, and I would argue a region, uh, in the form of uh, low housing uh, 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 prices and availability, um, poor transportation, disproportionate violence, poverty, and failing schools, and, and disproportionate violence, that you can't heal it in isolation. You actually have to heal the whole thing by lifting up what works. And, uh, and that's how I think we really will address this issue and do it successfully. And it's been done in other parts of the country. Thank you. Rapa, how about you? What, you know, you've, you've worked in uh, this, this field for a long time. I mean, how do you think we can translate what we need to do on a community-based level and lift it up to a regional level? Well, um, um, I'm happy to be here. Um, good morning. Uh, I think uh, earlier you were called a, a hearty group of people. Um, I'm hardy too, but it's cold, <laughs> all right? Uh, uh, just so that we get that straight. Hey, I just wanna, I just wanna follow up a little bit on something that Bill said about where we're going and shift it slightly in terms of where we're at. Um, the demographic shift that we're in right now is not a philosophy, it's not a perspective, it's not a political point of view, it's a reality. In many ways, many, many ways, no pun intended, that train has left the station, right? And if we think about a person born 30 years ago, they were born into a country where 80% of its population was white. That 30-year-old today is facing in a completely different environment. And by, and by 2040, when they're turning, to retirement, less than 50% of the population will be white. That means that we're moving to a country, a nation, that's majority of color. In, in 2040, 42% of our region will be people of color. So that's not ifs and ands or maybes or could be's or ought to be's, that's the real deal, right? So when we're looking into the future in terms of economic competitiveness, and we're looking at our greatest challenges, as well as our greatest opportunities, it is that diversity that exists in this region that will be the bed seed that nurtures the possibilities that exist for us. And it is that, that kind of uh, innovation, adaptability, and connectivity locally, nationally, and internationally that I think is going to be um, critical in the future. And it's going to take that rich diversity to move us to what will be the next area of economic prosperity. Either we invest or we regress. There's no place to Thank you. Sandra, I have a question. I, you, you've you know, really worked on um, a place-based strategy um, in your uh, work. So what types of investments should we be thinking about? What, uh, how do we do this to scale, not just in North uh, Minneapolis, but in the other RCAPs in the region? And, and how do we connect people to opportunities? What do you see as promising? Yeah, and, and Susie, can I just um, piggyback on Rapa just a, a little bit? Um, so our place-based strategy, our mission is to create a culture of achievement in a geographic zone of North Minneapolis where all children graduate high school college ready. Uh, and we're using education as a lever. Our goal is to end, end uh, multi-generational poverty as we know it, again, using education. And the reason it's so important for the region um, in, in terms of some of the numbers that Rapa uh, talked about, and Todd Klingel is here, and we've talked about this quite extensively um, um, in terms of the zone, but as, as well as the region. It's just that um, last year, for the first time, 
um, a comparison of four-year high school graduation rates were done across the country where they used the same measure. And what they found was Minnesota came in second to last in graduating African-American students in four years, came in dead last of all the states. Only Nevada beat us with their African-American students. I want to find out what's happening there. <laughs> and then um, dead last with Latino and American Indian students of all in the entire country. And then when we look at who our youngest citizens are, here in Ramsey County, 50% um, of the children, zero to five today, are children of color, in line with what Rapa was talking about. In Hennepin County, we're getting very close to 50%. And so when you look, and, and in Minneapolis, African American um, children, scholars we call them, uh, are only graduating at a 37% graduation rate. You don't build an economy on that. Uh, and in fact, what we keep talking about is one of the reasons, I think, Susan, you mentioned that we have 18 corporations here today, mm -hmm. um, Fortune 500. Mm -hmm. um, well, they're not here because of our beachfront property, right? Uh, they're here because we've had an educated workforce. So if we just do the math, um, we are running into a tragic, tragic collision with what's happening today, unless we address education. And so within the zone, what we're doing is um, we have uh, family engagement at the center where parents are leaders. Um, we have 556 families who are engaged in the Northside Achievement Zone. And again, um, this culture of achievement. Working with over 37 partners, nonprofits, uh, city officials, you know, Hennepin County, so on and so forth. And we have erected an a education pipeline as well as a whole family support pipeline. You need both, right? And so the education pipeline, we're working with partners from early childhood, um, from the womb to work, early childhood, our K through 12 partners, uh, expanded learning, mentoring, and, the, and college, of course, all getting together, um, looking for outcomes and strategies for the same families and the same scholars. And then the whole family support is so that ACEs are removed from children's lives, um, adverse childhood experiences. And so we are working with career financial pathway organizations to make sure these families who have been stuck in generational poverty, um, again, very man-made, so that they can break out of that and look for not just a job, but also a career. And then they're working with housing organizations. You know, a huge, huge issue in our neighborhood. I don't know if anybody saw the uh, article that was written in yesterday's paper uh, about how North Minneapolis has been disproportionately hit by the foreclosures. Nobody feels it more than, than our families. And the house they highlighted yesterday on Hillside Avenue is one that is about five, block, five houses up from Don and I. And it was one that was, you know, seven years ago worth 50,000, then it went up to 65. Then at the height of the foreclosure crisis, it went to $290,000. And just recently sold for 46,000. And uh, to an investor. And, and I think the investor said something really um, prophetic because we always complain about the slumlords. And many of them are slumlords. The, 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 the jury is out for this one, but I can kind of tell you. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, that, that we complain that the investors are taking over. And what he said, I think, pretty appropriately is it's not just that investors are taking over. It's that people are unwilling to move to North Minneapolis and live in a place and be part of the transformation. And that's what the zone is doing, working with, again, 556 families, changing everything about their lives all at once, parenting education, and all of the services that we're doing wrap around. And all of our partners are using the same web-based tool um, so that we're communicating about the same families and the same scholars. And they're on a trajectory, and they're on a plan. So we have a two-generation approach, Susan, and I, think, and I think what we're doing in Minneapolis, in North Minneapolis, can be scaled up anywhere. It's happening here in St. Paul as well with the St. Paul Promise neighborhood. It's happening in 61 communities around the country. And, and we're just, and really the thing that's scalable are the best practices. And that's where the real key comes from, that we just don't do what we've always done and think something's gonna be different, but that we lift up what's working in education. And there are things that are working in education around the country from early childhood to, to college, in housing, in career, in, in partnering with the families not saving the families, not ask, acting like a social worker on steroids, but saying, I am your partner uh, as you look to change the trajectory for your families. And I tell you, you know, and Susan, I'm, I'm going to stop here. Our 556 families are all on a continuum of healthiness and dysfunction, like all of us in this room. Uh, many of them have been trapped in generational poverty. 
But what I keep saying is that I have such hope because these families are showing up and they're showing out. And I mean in a good way because we're not forcing them to go to the parenting education program. We're not forcing them to, to sa sign a college bound commitment as soon as they sign up, but they're doing it and they're hungry. They're hungry for this region, for this city to, to really address the disparities that are happening right in our midst that we created and that we can change. It's great. It's great to hear the optimism uh, and the investment strategy. Uh, Bill, t tell me a little bit about what do you uh, think uh, from a business perspective? Uh, Sandra was talking about some of the best practices. What is the task of project thinking? Are some of the business best practices here? The, um, one of the things we did as part of the project was went around and talked to some companies. And there are some companies in town that are doing much better than others on this. And what, what we found, there were really four keys to the puzzle. And the four keys were number one was to have a business case. And uh, you know, as a business, it's easy to get somebody's attention with a business case. It's a lot harder to get somebody's attention with a moral case, because you're not paying me for the moral case. You're paying me to, to do my job and to deliver results. So what's the business case? The second one is you've got to have C-level leadership, which means the CEO has got to really want it to happen. The third is you have to build cultural competency inside the organization so that when, when you actually make some progress, um, people succeed. And the fourth is you've got to have the tactical initiatives. You know, what's your strategy for actually reaching out and finding people that look different than you have? And so at the Itasca group, what the, the challenge is it's pretty straightforward to think about doing that. The, the great thing at Thriving, and some of you have heard me say this before, our, our company is, a, is an incredibly diverse organization representing all flavors of Lutheran. <laughs> uh, all of them covered. And, and, and this is a, a true fact, we are 98.2% white. And so we perfectly reflect the market that we serve. Uh, we do not accurately reflect the market of people that go to church every Sunday, which is the, the folks we want to serve. And so as we think about what we need to do, the good news when you come 30 years to, late to the party is, it's a pretty straightforward path you've got to run down to do better. And the challenge is, how do you do it at a region? And I think you know, the business case to me is, exactly what Rapa said is, if we don't, we got real problems. I mean, we have to solve the, the $35 billion question. Or as a region, we're really in trouble. Uh, I think we do have some C-level leadership from, from folks like the Met Council, and the, exciting to see both mayors uh, address this as part of their, their kickoffs this year. I don't know how we build cultural competency in this region, and I think that is a really big challenge. Uh, I think schools have a role to play. I think churches have a role to play. I think businesses have a role to play. But I think if we don't really start to work on that one, the tactical initiatives aren't going to work. And uh, you know, I think that would continue to be a big challenge. And I'm not sure exactly what the path forward is. But that seems to me to be a missing piece that we're going to have to tackle. And it's not easy. I mean, I think. Uh, Anybody who's done any of those, uh, the IDI or any of the cultural assessments knows that almost 100% of the people think they're more culturally competent than they are. <laughs> and that would have been true for us, including, I mean, you know, people who've been thinking and working on this. So, so I think that, that to me is the challenge. And I'm, you know, as a company, uh, what, where we need to do work is we need to reach out and connect a community. Because when we put, when we go looking for people, we get people that look like us. We don't get people that don't look like us. So we have to get to the tactical initiatives. But before we do that, we, we're working really hard right now on cultural competence. So. That's great. Thank you so much on that. And Rapa, you know, how about what are some of the best practices that you think about, about how do we engage communities in decisions about how we invest in, not only in their neighborhoods, but in the region overall? And how, how do we do that better? So, so let me, let me um, make a, a comment just following up on sure. some, of the, some of the things that I think inspire me and that I think are critical to any um, sustainable anchor change um, that can occur um, are examples that I think are existing now. Um, one, uh, there is a large group of um, leaders, um, political, uh, philanthropic, um, nonprofit uh, public that are working together in integrated ways 
um, have been for the last three years under what was called Corridors of Opportunity and now the Partnership for Regional Equity. This idea of looking at the region as a whole across jurisdictions, across areas of focus, I think is, is, is a critical part of how we move forward. The other is that when I think about this, oftentimes what's missing is a framework and a roadmap and some infrastructure for how you get to where you're trying to go. As we speak, and you mentioned it earlier, Sue, uh, the Met Council is rolling out Thrive MSP 2040, accompanied by a fair housing equity and, and a, a fair housing and equity assessment tool that will inform it about where those R caps are and where there's possibilities for different kinds of investments. I think a bold um, effort in that would be to overlay equity throughout that process. I think. Uh, again, oftentimes we talk equity in abstract, but here's a platform and a framework for beginning to test out practice. And I want to just touch on the practice, best practice piece, because I don't know if there is all best practice. I think about 30% of what we do is innovation and trial and error and discovery. And then about 40% of what we do is good practice. We've learned enough to practice some things over because it gets us somewhere. And we can get some platform around principles, basic practices, but the rest has to be targeted and customized. And then the last 30% you can gleam off as best practices. Those are things that we know if we do them over and over and over again with the same ingredients in the same process, we get the same results. And we have to make room for all three of those if we're to make big changes. The last piece that I would just add to this, it, excuse me, has to do with community engagement. What we have in this region now is a community engagement infrastructure that did not exist three years ago. You can scan the region and you have people from different cultural and ethnic and geographic backgrounds and experiences coming together in coordinated ways bringing that knowledge to the table in ways that they've never brought it before. That didn't exist three years ago. And so those things together, a broad framework, some good practical tools, and, and, a, and a way of engaging and bringing people to the table in ways that have traditionally been unrepresented and disconnected are gifts. And if we don't figure out how to tap that, and maximize it, we would have lost a huge opportunity. I think that, it, that to your question about best practices, given what I said about best practices, I think every any time we vision, we vision should vision together. Any time we plan, we should plan together. So people should be engaged early. People should not just be engaged for input. People should be engaged for benefit as well. So if I'm engaged, why not position me so that the businesses that evolve, the home ownership, the cho choice housing, the contracts, that that's part of my engagement as well. So it goes beyond getting people to the table and weighing in. It's about anchoring prosperity. And when you don't anchor prosperity, you end up where you're at three, four. Thank you. That was great. Well, tell me, I have uh, one or two more questions, and then um, uh, mainly what I'd like to know is, um, and I think you've touched on it, because I like to end on um, a, an optimistic moment, because I think we are more inspired to act when we see opportunity and we see hope. And I do see hope. I see hope in the leadership of the three of you representing many, many, many people and organizations behind you. But just, you know, uh, you know, why don't we just start with Bill and go on down the line? Just what gives you hope? And uh, what do you hope to see five years from now in this community? I guess when I, th when I um, what gives me hope is, uh, uh, we were talking before, on Thursday we've got a group of large employers that probably represent, I don't know, 30, 40,000 jobs in the metro. The CEOs are close to CEOs showing up to talk about how are we going to move the needle? How are we going to create jobs? 
and how are we going to make sure we fill those jobs with a with a th in a way that leverages the entire breadth of the the metro that gives me hope because i think it's i think we've diagnosed the problem to death and i think everybody's at least a lot of us are pretty comfortable that we know the problem the question is what are we going to do to move the needle so uh, that's what gives me hope and i i hope um one of the things we're trying to do is to actually track our progress as a group. So where are we starting from and where do we want to be in five years? I don't know where we want to be, but we want to be farther towards a, uh, a more equitable mix of jobs than we are today. So. Great, good. How about you, Sandra? Couple things. Uh, our new mayor-elect, well, she's no, she's no longer mayor-elect, she's mayor, uh, <laughs> Betsy Hodges. Um, and, and Betsy, and, and really, not to score any points, Betsy's been working on the north side in partnership with the work that's happening there for like, over a decade, and so um, so she brings authentic leadership to addressing uh, inequity because it's it's the air she breathes, and so that is so cool. And then what's so cool with her leadership and with um, the leadership of the Met Council also, uh, Sue, is that you know people have to get out of their lanes. You know before it's like oh we got an elected school board let's not bother that oh we got the Met Council let's just stick with that. We cannot address these issues if we stay in our lanes, because the problems aren't in one single lane. Um, and, and ultimately, the thing that gives me greatest hope and wakes me up every morning and rocks me to sleep at night are the 556 resource poor brown and black families that have committed to a college-bound trajectory for their children and a different life. And they are, I mean, many of them are saying they no longer want to be perennial recipients of social services, but they want to be determinants of their own destiny. And I think they're getting to a place where they will make great partners for any municipality or, or body that wants to work authentically in community with people who want to see change and are ready to make it happen. Great. Thank you. How about you, Rapa? Two things I would say. One is uh, I've not um, until recently heard the terms equity and economic competitiveness matched together. That to me is a huge step for us and I think that the two are intricately connected. And the more we understand that, the better off we are in terms of trying to create any, uh, a region where all prosper. The second piece is that I think we're caught up in a national and a local, but a national as well, energy and movement around equity. That it ain't just up to us. That, there's a, that, there's th that things are happening around us as well. And as we talk about moving into the future, the future is coming right at us. And the space in between is getting smaller and smaller every day. And that inspires me because sometimes we need to be bumped. And I think we're in places now and at stages now where we're going to be doing a lot of bumping and we won't be able to ignore what the, what the bigger environment around us is doing. And as much as that bumping might throw us off a little, I think it also moves us forward and I'm encouraged by that. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to add uh, a huge thank you to coming out on a cold morning to you um, and what I love about what you said is you know what, uh, this challenge is a challenge that we can solve, but it takes leadership, and every person in this room is a leader. Um, you lead your own organizations, your own work groups, your own cities and your counties and your businesses, and it really is a personal commitment uh, to this that will allow us to succeed as a region. So thank you for being personally committed and for coming out today. So let's give them a huge, huge round of applause. And I, I forgot to thank one really important group at the beginning today, and that is the staff at the Metropolitan Council who do a phenomenal job. So thank you to the staff of the Metropolitan Council. We have bright, dedicated people, and I know they feel as urgently as I do about this issue. And it takes a sense of personal leadership and urgency for us as a community um, to really, to be able to think regionally but act equitably. Thank you for coming. Now I have two other things. Go to our website and look at Thrive MSP 2040 if you haven't. 
um, and get the summary of the Fair Housing and Equity Assessment that we um, have with uh, you today up at the desk as you leave if you didn't. Or go to our website to get it as well. And uh, thanks for being a part of a, a region and our leadership.